Let's stand and hear God's call to worship this morning from Psalm 99, verses 1 through 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord of all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for His glory. Thank you that you have endowed Him with your Spirit, and by that Spirit He judges the earth. We pray that your Spirit will be with us, renew us in your image, and strengthen us by faith. We ask for your blessing on the ministry of your Word and our fellowship together in Christ's name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing. We sing our opening hymn, hymn number 345. Brother John is ready to help with that. Pontius Pilate, 
Messiah was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Take of this idea 
of infinitude that is something that is without end. And so when it speaks of the knowledge of God as being infinite, uh, there is nothing that God doesn't know. He knows everything thoroughly and completely that could possibly be known. In fact, within the Trinity, there is an infinite knowledge existing between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father, the Spirit knows the Father and the Son. There are no mysteries there. It's not as though God is growing in His understanding of Himself or growing in His perception of the world. Now that brings up a challenge for us in our understanding of God. If He is all-knowing, if He is infinite in His knowledge, and if uh, He is infallible, how is it that God, being eternal, knowing all things as were in an immediate present, how is it that He understands things that happen in time? where there is a succession of moments, where there is a growth and progress in history. Well, perhaps one explanation for that is the fact that God has ordained all that should take place, and so that there are no mysteries to God in terms of the course of human history. He does not wait to discover what our human choices will be. He knows and has ordained that in eternity past. There is no mystery there for Him. And so history, in its course and direction, with all of its conflicts and troubles and strife, is all foreordained and governed by God. There are no surprises to Him. That tells us something about the way of salvation, that God is one who ordains those who should be saved, and He ordains the means by which they are saved. God does not send out an offer of the gospel in general and hope that some might respond favorably to that gospel. No, He knows who His elect are, and He brings them sovereignly, graciously, and powerfully to Himself. When we think then of God's providence and how His understanding of all things governs history, we are reminded by the confession that He is most holy in all of His counsels, works, and Commands. That's the challenge for us, isn't it? When we look at all the evils that take place in the world, and then you put behind that, or overlay that with the thought that God is in control of all things, that He's ordained whatsoever takes place, then the natural reaction is, as Paul brings up in Romans chapter 9, well, who can be blamed for what they do? God has ordained all these things, and perhaps shouldn't God Himself be blamed? But the scriptures remind us that God Himself is holy. He's without sin. He's perfect through and through. He is too pure to behold evil. That is, to look upon evil with favor. And so God uh, it remains above the corruptions of this world. He's untouched by those corruptions. We remain responsible for all that we do. How do we resolve all these, these things? God is infinite knowledge. God understands how these things work. And so uh, God ordains all things that should take place. And perhaps the greatest example of that is the cross of Christ and how God has ordained that the Lord Jesus would go into this world, suffer, be betrayed, uh, be hung on the cross, and uh, die there on that cross, all by the uh, will of God as foretold in the Scriptures. And so God ordained this but certainly this was the greatest evil that was ever done in human history. Mankind put to death the innocent, pure, righteous Son of God. What could be a higher crime than that? Yet through this, God is pleased to work out our salvation and to place our sins on Jesus, to punish Him for our sins so that our sins could be atoned for and so that we might have everlasting life. God's wisdom, His knowledge, His understanding of all things is infinite and infallible and also most holy in all things. And so the consequences for us is that to Him belongs all worship. God has ordained that we should exist for His glory. Our purpose in life really is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. 
And part of the way in which we can glorify God is by marveling at His knowledge and understanding of all things. He knows our hearts through and through. He knows our circumstances completely. There are no surprises for Him. And certainly all the mysteries of the universe are known by Him intimately. And so we can have full confidence in Him and His faithfulness to His Word and His commitment to His promises to bring us salvation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should then yield our lives over to Him to worship, service, and obedience as He uh, requires it of us. Let's turn to the Scriptures then and begin our readings from Scripture with Psalm 15. These texts will illuminate our sermon text and uh, our sermon this morning, so you might want to keep them in mind in the course of the reading and through the preaching of God's Word. Psalm 15 is a psalm of David. He writes, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And then from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 33, Isaiah 33, we have our next reading. Begin with verse 2, and read through verse 22. O Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. At the tumultuous noise, peoples flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered, and your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers. As locusts leap, it is leaped upon. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Behold, their heroes cry in the streets, Young boys of peace weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The traveler ceases. Covenants are broken. Cities are despised. There is no regard for man. The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert. And Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now, I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff, you give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you. The peoples will be as if burned to lime, like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Here you who are far off, what I have done, and you who are near, Acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid, trembling, as sees the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil. He will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him 
his water will be sure. Your eyes will behold the king and his beauty. They will see him a land that stretches afar. Your heart will muse on the terror. Where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? You will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand. Behold, Zion, the city of our appointed feasts, your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, an immovable tent, whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the Lord in majesty will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams, where no galley with oars can go, nor majestic ship can pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Finally, from James chapter 4, James follows the book of Hebrews towards the end of the New Testament. I just want to read verses 11 and 12 from that chapter. James chapter 4, 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to Him at this time and we'll conclude with the Lord's prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your Word and for Your promises. We thank You that we have a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who stands for us, that He is in heaven above even now, ruling over all things for the good of the church. We thank You, O oh Lord, that You've gathered together uh, this people in this place this morning that your word might be open to us, that we might see the glory of Christ and hear uh, your word of wisdom and knowledge and understanding given to us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and pray that he would be with us this day. We pray that he would illumine our hearts and minds and strengthen us to know your will and to follow it by the power of the resurrection of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would Bless First Church. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints here. We pray that you minister to our earthly needs. We thank you, Father, for your love and care for our membership over the years. We continue to give you thanks and praise for your care for uh, our loved ones at this time and pray that you would minister to them. Uh, we would uh, bring before you once again Rhoda, Joseph, and Manuel. We thank you for them and for the joy of their fellowship with us in years past. Pray, Lord, that as Rhoda suffers the effects of Parkinson's disease and as she becomes unstable on her feet, that your mercy and love will be upon her. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen and provide for her. We pray, Lord, that you would encourage her heart through the fellowship of the saints and the ministry of your word. We thank you for her family and for their care for her pray for your blessing on them as well. We pray for Manny. We thank you for his uh, length of life and many days. We pray for the work of your spirit in his heart, that he would rest in the Lord Jesus for his salvation. We pray, Lord, that he would uh, find joy in knowing you, and we pray that your blessing would be on him and his help. We pray that you protect him. Father, we pray for Eve Thomas, who is in a nursing home in Quakertown, we do pray that you would bring her comfort and encouragement, give her uh, endurance for this period of time, strengthen her faith in you. Pray, Lord, that she would have companionship and fellowship with others, and pray, Lord, that the staff would be uh, caring and uh, helpful to her. And Father, we pray for her family, for Marty and Kim, and for uh, Dennis and his wife, and for 
Danny and Mary, we pray, Lord, for your blessing on this family, that your spirit would be at work in them, accomplishing your good will. Father, we thank you for your care for the Hamels in uh, New York. We pray for Tamara, that you would continue to uh, strengthen her as she recovers from her surgery. We pray that the infections that she's experienced would be uh, brought under control. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless and strengthen her. We thank you for her father, Richard, and pray that you would uh, minister to him, be near to him. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are our good shepherd and that you are with your saints as they go through the shadow of death. We pray, Lord, that your mercies would be upon him, that your word would illumine his way. We pray that you would strengthen him with faith in you and give him joy in the morning that is coming before him. And we pray, Lord, that all of us would look forward with great joy to the dawning of that great and glorious day, whether we enter it first through a passing from this life or we see your glory revealed from heaven and the earth transformed and we transformed in the twinkling of an eye. We thank you for that coming day and pray that you would encourage us all to rest in you. We pray for Jack and Linda Kimmel. We thank you for them and their fellowship in Florida. We pray that you would bless them as they are attending a new Orthodox Presbyterian Church uh, there in their community. We thank you for Bay Haven Church and for its pastor. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on the ministry this morning. We pray that you continue to provide for Jack and Linda to minister to their spiritual and uh, earthly needs. We commit them to your love and care. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with uh, Chrissy. We pray that as she faces additional surgery on her abdomen, that your hand of healing and blessing will be on her. We pray particularly as this becomes a little bit more complicated due to the number of surgeries that she's experienced and possible reactions with the anesthesia. We pray, Lord, that your hand of mercy and love would be upon her, that you would protect her from harm. And we pray, Lord, that if she does undergo the surgery, that it would go well and smoothly, and she would be uh, free for a, a long time from these kinds of things. We thank you for her sisters and pray for your blessing and provision for them as well. Father, we pray for Mike. Uh, Chrissy's husband. We thank you for him. Uh, we rejoice in his uh, relationship to Chrissy. We do pray that you would minister to him, to his earthly needs, but especially we pray that your spirit would be at work in his life. We pray, Lord, that you would remind him that he is accountable to you, that he will uh, appear before the judge and see as we all will, and uh, give an account for his life. We pray, Lord, that your mercies would be on him that you would minister to him. Father, we pray that you would bless our church, bless the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and its ministries, bless our presbytery as it gathers this weekend, and pray that you would bless our session as we uh, serve your church. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom will come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
be the focus of our consideration today. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join men with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil. Nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many, so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one of who hates you lying down under his burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge, and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the help of your spirit as we explore his riches. We pray that you would lead us to our Savior and his glorious work on our behalf. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you watch the news and you hear various reports about crime and punishment, begin to wonder if there isn't a two-tier system of justice in our country. Justice for those who are politically favored and not so much justice for those who are not. There are many ways in which we can illustrate that. I don't want to get into a political sermon this morning, but uh, the concern that we might have is whether justice is indeed lying as we have in our Statue of Liberty, a blind uh, uh, statue uh, promising justice for all. Moses here has been expanding upon the law of God, and as ha happens in uh, ancient law codes, you find that there seems to be uh, some sort of a disjointed connection between one section after the other. If you're looking for a rational development of an idea here, it doesn't seem to be present. There's a little argument here about uh, slavery, an argument about the sanctity of life, uh, an argument about the rights to private property, um, and we're now coming to the idea of false witness. But these ideas are kind of intermixed, and this particular text is one example of that. You have uh, the first three verses which talk about witness bearing and the importance of being a faithful witness. At the latter part of, of the text, in verses 7 through 9, uh, you find that for 6 through 9, you find that there is, uh, again, a, a concern for justice in the courts. And some scholars make the point or the case that in the first three verses, you have the concern for the witnesses who appear before the court. And then in the latter half of the, the uh, section here, verses 6 through 9, you have the judges themselves and exhortations given to the judges as to how they are to conduct their courts. But right in the middle, you have something about what happens if you're wandering around and you see your enemy's ox or donkey straying far from his owner. And so it seems like, well, how does that fit in with the court system and the integrity of witnesses and the, the seeking of justice? I'll try to give what I think about that text here in a moment. Uh, I believe that in all, we can say that Scripture has its unity and its one author, God Himself. And God gives us a unified testimony as to what is right, just, and true, so that you don't have contradictory laws here and there, laws that act against each other. I have 
to think that if you were looking at our U.S. law code, particularly perhaps the IRS regulations and that sort of thing, there's got to be all kinds of different internal contradictions that you wonder how all this fits together. But you have in Scripture the word of the Lord who is faithful and true. And all that he says is just and right. And as we go through that, what we found in previous sermons recently, that God does not really give a law code by which Israel was to live, but he says that I am the one to observe your performance of the law code, and I protect the weak, I protect the poor, I protect the needy from oppression. I see crimes that are committed, and if there's not justice in the human court, there's certainly justice in the divine court. That divine court may reveal its judgments in the course of history and time, or God may be pleased to withhold that judgment for a period of time, indeed, not until eternity, until we see full justice being meted out. But we are reminded that God is the author of the law. The law is a unified whole, and we see different aspects of the law as it applies to the circumstances of life in which people are living. And perhaps that's where the, the unity or the, the order of things occurs here. You know, when you read the letters of the Apostle Paul, he's addressing real life situations. Way people, the, the things that people are dealing with on the ground. And so his letter to the church of Galatia has to deal with the, the uh, sanctity of the gospel message. We are saved by grace through faith alone and not by works righteousness. And the argument develops accordingly. But it's very much related to the pastoral concerns of that community. That's different from what we see in the letter of James. Is writing to a, a, a Christian community, but it has different concerns. God's word addresses different circumstances in life. And here Moses begins to consider another area of importance. Will the courts of Israel be different from the courts of the nations? Will the courts of God's people be places where justice is meted out, where the innocent are protected? where the guilty are punished? Or will the courts be corrupted by uh, the influence of money, power, threats to life, and so forth, popular opinion? Will all these kinds of cross currents corrupt the court and make it so that there's not justice to be found within Israel? God gives his people instructions as to how they are to conduct themselves so that they might enjoy the peace and well-being stability that true justice provides. We come to the, the legislation itself, and it begins in a very general term, and it, it addresses more specifics as we go along here. Uh, Moses first writes that you shall not... Uh, spread a false report. And so here he talks most generally about really all of our interactions with each other, our interactions within the community, and perhaps also in the various capacities in which we serve in our community. We are not to spread a false report. Well, what is a false report? It's interesting that when you look at the, the text here, the command is given baldly, if you will. It's given uh, in such a way that Moses does not explain what a false report is. The reason for that is that the law of God is written on our hearts. And we basically know the difference between truth and falsehood and what it means to give a false report. It's like a parent dealing with a little child. You don't have to teach a child what it means to lie. The child pretty much knows when it's lying. Now you have to punish the child for the lying. But the child knows when it's lying. You can tell by the red face, uh, by kind of the, the look down. Uh, the child knows deep in his heart what it said was a lie. Or 
or it might try to blame somebody else and cast a fit. We know what a false report is. God does not need to explain it in detail. Obviously, it's something which is contrary to truth, something that does not faithfully reflect the situation which we are speaking about. And so, in all of our dealings, we should refrain from speaking falsehoods and speak that which is truth. Truth sometimes can be painful, depending on the situation and uh, the circumstances. God calls upon us to refrain from spreading falsehoods. Now, there are different ways in which that can happen. One is that we knowingly tell a lie with certain motivations or purposes behind it. We tell a lie because we want to either escape the court's uh, examination of ourselves or to get somebody else into trouble, to get an enemy into trouble. We might have a competitor who has an advantage over us and we want to diminish his standing in the community. He might have a great widget that he's selling, but you might say, well, did you know that he gets that off of slave labor? Or something like that. And, and so you begin to diminish the man within the community. It's spreading a false report. Sometimes you can spread a false report without even knowing that it's false. Uh, you heard something, it seemed reasonable, you latched onto it because it confirmed your particular point of view, and then you began to spread it, tell others about it, when in fact you didn't check your sources, you don't know how accurate that is, and you might be spreading something which is not entirely true. And so even if we think we're telling the truth, we may be spreading a false report. That reminds us that we have to be very careful about what we hear from others. Not allow our ears to be caught up in different stories that are juicy and uh, exciting and pass them along. We'd rather be very careful to make sure that what we say is truthful and accurate. I've come across this with Facebook and other things where you see Meme on there. The comical thing is, well, Abraham Lincoln said, don't vote for Joe Biden. Obviously, <laughs> that, that's not true. But you, you have that kind of thing where a, a, a notable figure is attributed with, with a statement which may not be accurate, but perhaps reflects what Abraham Lincoln might say. And so you latch onto it and you quote it and you spread it around. Careful what you say. Do not spread the falsehood. Moses continues to develop this uh, concern for uh, witness bearing in the courts. And in particular, he goes on to talk about how our uh, bearing witness cannot be affected by the crowd, it cannot be affected by what popular opinion is. When everybody is going along in this one direction, it's very easy to go along with the crowd and join in with them. You can join them in doing something that is evil. There tends to be a kind of crowd mentality that uh, moves people along. And they think that, well, everybody else is doing it, so it must be right, without examining what exactly is going on. And so we need to be careful about the influence of the crowd around us. Popular opinion not always true. It can often be wrong. And the challenge is for us to be able to stand up to that popular opinion, state the truth, and risk the, the uh, attacks that come as a result of that. So we need not to follow the crowd and just do what's popular for the moment in time. So uh, Moses encourages us to be uh, immune or to be strong against these kinds of things. Rick and I know something about this in presbytery meetings. You find the presbyteries all cut up in one particular course of action, and you don't agree with that. It might be a, a judicial decision that the, the, the court of the church is pursuing, or it might be just a matter of principle or uh, course of action, and you oppose it. Do you stand up 
up and say anything about it, or do you just sit back and say, well, I'm not going to get in the way of this train. Let it go through. Um, there are times when you should be very tactical, or you have to choose your battles, I think, from time to time. But uh, please be quiet, Dad. No, please be quiet. But there are times to stand up and to forthrightly state your views. Stand for that which is true. And that's not always an easy thing to do. So Moses encourages us to uh, stand against the crowd and popular opinion and go ahead with our point of view. Uh, continuing then, one thing that strikes us as odd is that Moses says you should not show favoritism to the poor. Now that's something that uh, at first glance we might have a question about. It seems like in the Bible, as some, some uh, liberal theologians put it, God has a preferential option for the poor. God uh, basically allows them to go ahead with what they want to do and uh, is harder on those who are wealthy and, and uh, powerful and so forth. But in fact, God requires justice whether we are rich or poor. And poverty is not an excuse for immoral, improper behavior. And so, just because somebody is poor doesn't mean that we should uh, give them a little bit of slack and allow them to go on with their wickedness. You think of that in our current situation where you have George Soros appointed district attorney who are too favorable, too lax on those who are in their uh, in the court system and will not fulfill the, the penalty of the crime upon these folks. So we should not show partiality to those who are poor, but be careful to hold justice at every level of human society. In verses 6 and following, you find that Moses says, you shall not pervert the justice due to the poor in his lawsuit. And so here is a situation where the poor man has a just claim and should be able to prosecute his case, but because he's going against somebody who's rich, powerful, influential in the community, uh, people begin to uh, try to put obstacles in the, the, the path of the poor person who's trying to bring this uh, case to court. And so the case is delayed. Added expenses are brought, such that the poor man is not able to raise the funds to con conduct the trial and so forth. And so there are uh, different ways in which pressures are put upon the poor to prevent them from bringing their case to court, to trial, and then actually to get a, a sentence or a verdict against those who are rich, powerful, and in control of uh, the community. God says, you shall not pervert justice due to the poor in his lawsuit. Just because a man is poor doesn't mean he should not get justice. Then Moses says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. Here God uh, reminds us that he is one, again, who observes our law courts and the decisions that are made. And if you have a situation like you had in the time of Ahab and Jezebel, where there was a vineyard by a man named Naboth uh, adjoining the, the king's estate. And uh, Jezebel went into the community and got some uh, corrupt men to uh, lie in the court. And Naboth was in prison, punished and put to death, actually, so that Ahab could take possession of this vineyard. Well, here you have a situation where the innocent and the righteous are condemned and judged. God says, he will not acquit the wicked. What must we say about those who have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? Condemned him. The most innocent and righteous man of all. God will not acquit the wicked. He will bring judgment upon them. 
shall take no bribe for a bribe, bribe blinds the clear sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. I don't think this needs to be explained too much, but here you have the influence of money in the court system, and a judge may be given a little package of money, might be assured that there's a little something for him. If he uh, rules in this particular fashion, uh, you have in politics all kinds of money flowing through Washington, D.C. in different kinds of ways. domestically, but also foreigners as well. So these kinds of things tend to blind the eye. You see something, you know that justice lies with uh, this particular individual, but because there are some wealthy and powerful interests who support your political campaign or have supported different things in the community uh, and you don't want to go against them, then you might be tempted to uh, put justice aside for the time being and pervert justice. And so in all these ways, God is concerned that his courts bring justice to all. Now, as we go through these kinds of things, we wonder, who is it that is above reproach here in these kinds of things? Uh, you look at Psalm 15, where the psalmist speaks of those who, David, who speaks about who can dwell in the tent of the Lord. And the, the response is those who are righteous, who are just, who are, uh, do not swear falsely, and so forth. And so who is that person? We read in Isaiah the fact that, by the same token, who can dwell with the everlasting burnings? Our God is a consuming fire. So he examines the heart. He sees our inner corruptions. And there's no place to hide from him. And so what can we say about that? Well, there is one who is righteous and just, who has kept the law of God perfectly for us, even God's Son, Jesus Christ. And he is one who, though crucified, was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is now the judge of all mankind. So therefore, when there is a desire for justice, we may look at our earthly courts and see all of the corruptions and the pollutions that they contain. We may be frustrated that our particular case never seems to get justice. You think about the abortion decision back in 73. Would this ever be changed? And lo and behold, about nearly 50 years later, it was changed. Sometimes God is pleased to work through history and time in slow waves when justice comes. In the end, justice comes with the coming of Christ and his great kingdom. And then all of our uh, concerns will be satisfied at that time. Finally, I'll do a Jen Pisaki and circle back to uh, this little section in the middle of the text with regard to the care for the donkey and uh, the ox as they wander about. The donkey might be uh, carrying a load and gets tired after time and just goes to the ground, uh, exhausted. And it's one thing out of general concern for an animal's well-being to, to get it and bring it back to its master, to, to take the load off the donkey, allow it to rest, bring it some water, refresh it, and then help it go on its way. But the circumstance becomes complicated when the owner of the ox or donkey is somebody that is your enemy, somebody that you hate, or somebody that you know hates you. And why should you help him out at all? Why should you do anything that gives him, that secures him? I work for a mattress company called Sleepies, the Mattress Professionals. And every morning he would get on the phone in a conference call with the owner of the company. And he would talk about sales and the importance of things and so forth. But one of the things that he drop into our minds is that we have to crush the competition. Somebody comes in looking for a mattress, you sell them that mattress. And it doesn't matter what you got to do, you sell that mattress at cost, if necessary, to keep that customer from going to the next store. You make the sale. You crush the competition. So here is your enemy who's made life miserable for you in many different ways, perhaps in the courts, in, 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 uh, business and 
about it in your personal life. What do you do? Love your enemies, Jesus said. Do good to those who push you. And so the remedy is to show love to your enemy. To go out of your way to take care of him. And this is a way in which, as Paul says in Romans at the end of chapter 12, you uh, overcome evil with good. How do you change the nature of the situation? How do you change the animosity that this person has for you? Well, one way is to do good to that person. It's going to be very hard for him the next time to make life miserable for you if he remembers the fact that you saved his ox or donkey and brought that back to him and took care of it for him. He's going to be pretty embarrassed by that. Not only that, but by loving your neighbor, you show the love of God, who loved us while we were yet his enemies, and gave his son to die for us. God showed us that kind of love, that self-sacrificial love. So as we show that to our enemies, we are being models of God's love in the gospel of Christ, in the way of salvation there. So therefore, be encouraged to trust in the Lord and to yield the circumstances of history and time to Him. To speak the truth within the courts, not get in the favor one way or the other, and to take care not only of your friends, your neighbors, but even your enemies. So that God might be glorified. Father in heaven, we thank you for your law and pray that your spirit would strengthen us that we would be righteous and true and godly in all our ways. We pray that you help us to see the glory of Christ who has come to fulfill your righteousness on our behalf. We thank you for him and that his righteousness clothes us. We do pray that you would strengthen us to live for him this day and in all our days. We pray in Jesus' name.
is all sufficient for our sins. And so we pray for the forgiveness of our sins through our mediator, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. It's that same Jesus who says to us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Sing our final hymn in John.